and as she mentioned that we've been best friends in seventh grade so that means we've gone through a lot together uh, a lot of boy crushes high school drama and angst um, you know uh, applying to colleges and even though we we went separate ways in college we always stayed very close and I was so glad to be able to share you know my my life with her and um, and now I'm so excited to see her in her new role as a mom here's her official bio Lynn Connor always felt lost but found herself through writing she received her MFA in creative nonfiction from Mills College and has been published in the Asian American literary journal Kartika Review Gazillion Voices Magazine, Adoption Today Magazine, as well as PAX POV newsletters. Currently, Lynn has a love-hate relationship with her memoir and hopes to return to her YA fiction manuscript someday. In the meantime, Lynn is a certified Amherst Writers and Artists, Artists Affiliate leading creative writing workshops through Lost Lit. She resides in Brooklyn, New York with her husband, Grumpy Burt, their furry son, Remy the Pug, and baby Emmy. Please welcome Lynn. getting rough back there. <laughs> okay. Um, okay. Uh, growing up as my mother's daughter, I used to think I wanted to be just like my mother. I'd wait until I was 40 to be a mother. I'd go to college first. I'd travel the world. I'd live my life fully before settling down, buying a house in the suburbs with a big backyard, and handing over my freedom to a kid. I would adopt just like her. I would be single, strong, independent, just like her. But when she died on May 11, 2005 from metastatic breast cancer, I was 28. My surprising reaction to grief, to the loss of losing her, was to lock everything down. I wanted to marry my boyfriend of nine months. I wanted to buy a house. I wanted to someday be a mother. I wanted a family that would never leave me. Flash forward to the year 2016, where I was everything but just like my mother. I was married, not single. I did not want to adopt. I wanted to give birth to a daughter so I could experience what my birth mother must have felt. We could, not to, we could not afford to buy a house, or probably ever. We lived in Brooklyn, not the suburbs of nowhere, New Jersey. So when it happened, when it was time to be a mother, along with the wifing and working and keeping my identity loud, not silent, I didn't know how. I wasn't ready. I didn't know how to keep all the balls in the air without losing one. One lost ball meant failure, game over. On August 22, 2016 at 8.02 p.m., Emmy Vian Chow slid out as if on a slip and slide and not being a drama queen stuck behind my pelvic bone. The crying is incessant, like a car alarm that goes off because a biker just had to tap the hood of a Jaguar parked along Fort Green Park and just on and on until someone screams, is somebody gonna get that, anyone? Who set off it in the first place? But it's not her crying I wasn't prepared for. She's a baby, of course she was gonna cry. What no one told me was how much I would cry. <laughs> Hold on. Uh, pre my mom dying, I never cried. Crying was not allowed, especially as a girl, a woman. My mom used to say to me, never, never cry at work in front of a man. They won't understand. They will take it as weakness. They will use your tears, your emotions, your vagina against you. Never cry. Post my, ma my mom dying, I couldn't stop crying. It's like almost three decades of stored up tears came out monsoon season with no end in sight. Now with a newborn, I cried at least three times a day, like clockwork, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I cried because I was so tired yet hungry, and when the baby napped, I only had 20 minutes to either pee, shower, eat, or try to sleep. This dilemma broke me, and so I cried. I cried when it was time to give her a bath because no one told me how to hold her gumby head without dr drowning. I cried when I got my third plug duck and my breast felt like bowling balls and I was getting hot flashes in a 110 degree oven apartment 
and then an hour later got the chills so bad I thought I was in the Antarctic and I just wanted a polar bear to kill me. Just fucking kill me because of the pain and my body couldn't take it. Then I thought if I died, I'd abandon my baby and since I was an abandoned baby, I would never, never do this. So I cried even harder because I just wanted to be a good mother. Now I'm five weeks postpartum. Um, I'm now five weeks postpartum. My mother-in-law, who I invited into our home to help because everyone said, after the baby comes, do you have help? Do you have family? Is your mom coming? At which point I'd say, oh, my mother-in-law will help. She's coming, not my mother. When my sister-in-law innocently praised, oh, how generous of you, letting her in, I did raise an eyebrow. And a week before their arrival, when I was more worried about my father-in-law catching a nipple, or a naked, my naked, heaving, soaking breast, oozing milk, ready to plump and shut up the baby. My sister-in-law prophesies, it's not daddy you have to worry about, it's mom. <laughs> On the third day of my mother-in-law's 14-day stay, she asked me, do you ever clean? She was throwing out rotting fruit in the refrigerator that had grown hipster beards. I'm in a jersey tank dress that has a built-in bra. Okay. It's my nightgown and house dress all in one. I'm a deer in headlights. I've been blinking a lot in hopes to appear alert, not sleep standing. Cleaning will make you feel good. Don't you want to feel good? My mother-in-law hisses at me making sure my husband was out of sight, and then she delivers a final blow. Didn't your mother ever teach you how to clean? I have carpal tunnel in both wrists because of this kid. Okay. Um, if I had to describe my mother, it would be hashtag strong woman. I've always taken this for granted. This was my mother. She was a librarian where silence wasn't a pun punishment, it was law. In memo sheets that were distributed in everyone's office mailboxes, silence, always remember silence. My mother was strong in the work world, in a man's world, and at home. Since there was no father, she played the man role. She preferred hammering and caulking the bathroom rather than cleaning the toilets. My mother refused to cook and clean so much that she hired Kate, the housekeeper, who came every Wednesday afternoon. We were not rich, but my mother sacrificed driving around in a Lexus just so she didn't have to degrade herself to housewife. This is partly why she never married. My mother refused to cook and clean so much, she said, no, I will not pack a bag lunch for you. No, I will not stand at the bus stop in the morning like the other stay-at-home mom so you won't feel lonely. I was seven. So to answer my mother-in-law's question, didn't your mother ever teach you to clean? The cold coffee I'm about to swallow, it's threatening to launch like a missile at my command. I tell it to stand down, be a strong woman like your mother, because this woman equated domesticity to a woman's worth, and I was taught the opposite. By day seven, my mother-in-law's visit, I feel like a trapped prisoner. Every move I make, where I struggled to grasp at my former pre-baby life, where I'd go in the morning and get a Stumptown coffee from Hungry Ghost, then I'd buy lunch, perhaps a deli sandwich from La Bagel or Academy Diner, and then I'd go to the Annex Cafe for my afternoon coffee and work on my laptop. Working, I was working, or Facebooking. I can't do any of that with her here. She won't let the baby go out, but if I leave the apartment, I, I'm a bad mom because I'm not taking care of the baby, so I stay in. And I feel like there's a pinhole in my lung and soon I won't be able to breathe on my own. Lung failure, heart failure, death. On the fourth floor walk up a part of our apartment, our attic in the sky, it's too small to contain all of us. There's a blanket of heaviness where no light and no air is allowed. When will my mother-in-law leave? I wonder, is this postpartum depression? Is this it? Am I in it, experiencing it? 
But I figure it's like love. If you have to ask yourself, am I in love with this person? Then you most likely are not. Finally, I can't take it anymore, and I force everyone out of the house. We are going to the park. The baby needs air. We need space to breathe. I read on enough mommy Facebook forums that it's completely safe to go outside with the baby, even at five weeks old. In retaliation, my mother-in-law has cocooned the baby into the car stroller with three layers of blankets. It's mid-September and 80 degrees outside. Summer is refusing to let go. I hate the heat, the humidity. I hate that my newborn daughter was born in August, the worst month of, of the summer in New York. I want to snap. I fu it's fucking hot outside. She doesn't need a coat or a sweater or a little beanie on her head so the heat doesn't escape and she'll die. I want to say a lot to my mother-in-law, who is not my mother. I want my mother alive. Because all of her bad judgments and criticisms I can handle. I can lob back at her. My tongue can outstab her, make her bleed, hit her in the spot under the heart that makes her question every mothering decision, make her feel like a bad mother. But I can't wound my mother-in-law because she came here to help with the baby and she's not my mother. My mother-in-law finally left. The baby and I somehow made it through what everyone calls the first three months of roughness. It is not rough, it is hell. It is worse than hell, but I survived somehow, just barely. And you will too, don't worry. You might be asking yourself, why did I, what did I learn? What words of wisdom can I pass on to a fellow new mommy? I learned that not only was my mother a certain kind of strong woman, she was a certain kind of mother. If you want to call her anti-mom, that's fine. But her thinking seeped into my bones. I was programmed as my mother's daughter. I learned that my mother-in-law is the kind of woman that get married, be a good servant wife, and self-sacrifice everything in the name of your children. The kind of woman my mother hated, that she railed against and hoped to high heaven I would never become. She'd say, never, le never let a man control you. I learned that the kind of value and priority you place on being a woman has everything to do with the kind of mother you will become. My mother is dead, she is li but she lives in me, through me. Sure, it would be nice to have her alive and to help with the baby, but she is not. And all I can do is believe in everything she has taught me is good enough. That I'm a strong woman, that I will be a good mom, and I will raise my daughter to define what a strong woman means to her. Thank you.